<laughs> As it is written, the John Cave Show podcast has returned. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about Will Smith posts the first picture of Bad Boys 4. But are audiences ready for Will Smith to return? The first reactions for Kung Fu Panda 4 are out, and they're actually looking pretty good. The greatest of all time, Daniel Day-Lewis. We've been hoping he'll come back. But we just got a not so good update on that. Also, House of the Dragon is coming back. Season two starts in June. Dune Part Two will never release its deleted scenes because Denis Villeneuve says, hey, listen, when you cut a scene from a movie, it's dead. And a couple of movie theater chains in Canada are actually raising ticket prices just for Dune. Why? Because they're evil. We're going to talk about that and a few things more. The John Cavish Show podcast starts right now. <laughs> Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campia Show podcast, coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio. Guys, I'm joined today in studio by Ray Aura. Hey, hey, hey. We got Jonathan Voico. Hey. We got Chris Carr. Hey, guys. And I am, of course, John Campia. And it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you. Our international friends gather around so we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. And here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics that I listed off. Then in the last part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you guys got a thought, theory, opinion, question, observation that you'd like us to address on the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature to fire that in, and we will get to that at or near the end of the show. All right, guys. With that all down, let's get things started here with this, shall we? Bad Boys 4. <laughs> which I believe, Ray, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's coming out in June. I think I think they said June 7th is going to be opening the same day as the highly anticipated Crow reboot that everybody globally got excited about when that Bill Skarsgård image came out. I mean, it just sent the enthusiasm into overdrive. A little bit of sarcasm there, I suppose. But here's the thing. This new picture they just put out for Bad Boys 4, very Bad Boys kind of image. Like, this is a Bad Boys classic kind of image. I, I like this image a lot. And you know what? I'm not as big of a Bad Boys guy as a lot of other people are. I mean, I enjoyed the first two Bad Boys. I did. They're not, to me, they're not all-time classics, but I like them. I quite enjoyed number three. Had a really good time with it, and I'm looking forward to number four. But as we're now getting pretty close, it's only about four months away for Bad Boys 4. June 7th. June 7th. Here's the question that I have. Are audiences ready for Will Smith to come back in a big way? I mean, because you can already make the argument he was in that Antoine Fuqua movie uh, that was an Apple TV Plus one. I can't remember the name of it. I think it was Emancipation. I think that was the name of it. And But nobody really saw that. It, it, so I'm not really going to count that one. But after the infamous slap heard around the world at the Oscars, <laughs> are people ready for Will Smith to return? And I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah. I mean, the feeling I'm getting from people online is that, yeah. it's a, And listen, I'm only going to speak for myself here. I was as, you know, kind of disgusted by what Will Smith did at the Oscars a couple of years ago as much as anybody. It was completely unacceptable what he did. Uh, and there needed to be consequences. And you know what, though? There have been consequences. The man was globally humiliated. He lost out on a number of projects, cost him in the wallet a huge amount of money, counting into the millions and millions and millions and millions that it cost him. And then he continued to be humiliated by Chris Rock and others after. And well-deserved. Well-deserved. But for me, at some point, you go, okay, has he, quote-unquote, served his time? Has he paid the fine? Has he, you know, suffered the consequences for his actions? And at some point, are we ready to say, okay, he's done. It's time to move on. I hated what he did at the Oscars, but he's paid the price. And, and again, I'm not saying other people should feel that way, because if you don't, I'm not saying you should. I'm only speaking for myself, that it's cost him more money than I'll ever make in my life. 
It's cost him more public humiliation than I'll ever feel, and I've suffered a lot. And I'll probably, because of my own actions, probably suffer more in the future, but never to the degree that Will Smith has. And, you know, Chris Rock is okay. <laughs> Chris Rock's fine. He's walking around, still doing his thing. And I, I think it's time for me as an audience member to move on. And I think the general audience may be as well. Anyway, Chris, I, I remember we were doing shows when the, the incident happened. Yes. And we were all like, number one, disappointed by the actions, surprised by the actions. When you look at Will Smith's public persona, like I never would have guessed him to do something like that. But is it time, that was years ago now, is it time now for, for him to come back and for audiences to come back? What do you think? I think so. I think it's a, especially with this film and this franchise, I think this is a great time for, for Will Smith to come back. Um, I've said it before on here, and obviously this is not a, well, let's just measure different crimes and assaults against each other. But we have had many actual bad boys in Hollywood come back very quickly or not even get any punishment from much more egregious actions. Um, Emile Hirsch comes to mind, other actors come to mind, you know, who have assaulted people really horrifically violently. And then I see them in films or I hear their voice and stuff or, or things like that. Um, what Will Smith did was absolutely not okay. But again, when that's kind of your litmus test of how other people's behavior has been treated, it does make me think, He's apologized. He went on the apology tour. It's up to you, the audience, to decide how sincere you felt that was. I personally felt that his apologies were very sincere. Were they probably glossed over by a, a PR person? Absolutely. 100%. Whose wouldn't be? <laughs> Whose wouldn't be in his position? But I do think he was sincere in his apology. I do think that he was very, very um, graceful and tactful when it came to emancipation. You know, he did interviews back in 2022 talking about how he fully understood if audiences were not ready to see him in a film again and that he felt horrible that he was the person keeping this movie from fully succeeding as it mm. could because of his actions um and I, I like that he took ownership like that i think we live in a world where it's really easy to deflect and not actually own up to things that you've done and i think that he should have a comeback if somebody like mel gibson can if somebody mm. uh, well maybe he hasn't had a full comeback yeah. <laughs> but if other people can start making movies again if he can be in a movie with will ferrell about christmas and fathers i think will smith can be in bad boys and people can flock to theaters and, you know, here's the thing, too. Like, I try to remind myself and other people about this sometimes. And this is in no way any justification for what Will Smith did. I'm well on record about how disappointed I was that he did that. But the big difference between Will Smith and everybody on this show and watching this show is that when we have our worst moments, we don't have cameras on us broadcasting it to a billion people around exactly. the world. And, and I, I think, again, that's not justifying anything that what Will Smith did. I'm just saying it's something to keep in mind about the whole thing, too. So I'm ready for Bad Boys 4, and I think a lot of other people are, too. I'm sure not everybody will be, and I understand, but I think a lot of people will be. Question is for you guys. What do you think? Are you looking forward to Bad Boys 4? Do you think other people are ready to go back to the theaters to see Will Smith again? Has enough time passed? Is it ready to move on? Let us know down in the comments section below. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, one of the non-Pixar animated franchises that I've really enjoyed, there's not a ton of them. Uh, How to Train Your Dragon is absolutely one of those. But Kung Fu Panda is another. Kung Fu Panda, especially the first two, I'm not a huge fan of the third one, I admit, but especially the first two, are films that are much better than they have any business being. Because not only are they, is it funny because it's Jack Black doing the voice of a Kung Fu master panda, but it's legitimately endearing and it's charming and it's funny and it's fun. And I really enjoy the first couple of movies a lot. So we've got Kung Fu Panda 4 coming now and it's opening up this week and we got our first reactions. And I'll be honest with you, these are a little bit late for first reactions because the movie opens in two days. So I'm a little bit nervous. But so far, the first reactions have actually been pretty strong. Uh, we get this from the folks over at the Direct who are writing. Uh, for instance, Laura uh, Sirkrell, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, writes, was Kung Fu Panda 4 necessary? Probably not. But it's an adorable film to continue Poe and his future successor stories. It's funny and was a good full circle regarding the film's villains of before. It's great for future generations who are parents now who watch the first like Toy Story. Ramaskreen wrote, 
you're going to have to probably reset that. Ramaskin mm -hmm. wrote, Kung Fu Panda 4 was awesome. It didn't disappoint me at all. The fights and the animation uh, this time also looked more electric. Viola Davis was deliciously sinister as the villain. Aquafina's Zen was sly and Jack Black's Poe once again rocked. Uh, we move on to Raphael who wrote, uh, Meet the Dragon Warrior. Kung Fu Panda 4 continues to show that this franchise has the best action in American animation, but I was very surprised by how fun this movie's buddy cop dynamic is. Tessa Smith of Mama's Geeky wrote, Kung Fu Panda 4 is a ton of fun. Jack Black is as hilarious and lovable as ever. Aquafina is a wonderful addition, and the two of them together are fantastic. Stunning animation and incredible action sequences, plus a worthy story that sets up for more and and it just kind of goes on and on like none of the reactions i were reading are saying you know best animated film of the year i didn't read anybody saying this is a masterpiece of animation or anything like that but generally speaking all the reactions were kind of hey this is a ton of fun this is really good jack black's on point as ever the it was it's got all the humor of it, it's got the heart and a lot of them saying it opens the door for more to come later whether we're going to get more or not, I don't know. I won't see Kung Fu Panda for another two days or so. Anyway, Chris, first of all, I don't know that I've ever asked you, what are your thoughts on the Kung Fu Panda movies themselves? Oh, Have man. you been looking forward to this one? And what do you make about the reactions we're hearing? I very much enjoy these films because I'm a huge Jack Black fan. I love him. I believe we share a birthday. I believe his birthday is the same day as really? mine. Really? Um, and I'm one of those people who, if you watch The Holiday and you think Jude Law is the love interest you want, you and I are not the same. <laughs> you want to be with Joe, uh, you want to be with Black here. You want to be with him. I'm really excited about this movie and I'm glad that they're doing, uh, they're getting these good reviews and everything. I think the smartest thing they've done, though, is have Tenacious D do a song for it. Because I didn't know they did that. They had this lovely viral moment of uh, Jack and K KG doing um, Hit Me Baby One More Time just oh on God. Instagram. And it's a great cover of what they released so far. And apparently it is made for Kung Fu Panda, where it was, hey, we want Tenacious D to do a song. Cool. Can it be Britney Spears? Sure. Why not? Hit Me Baby One More Time. Okay. Tight. Thanks. Oh, my God. Now i got to see this movie. <laughs> I'm, I, I want to see it just for that. And I think it was one of the smartest marketing moves they could do of just, yeah, Jack Black, go do your Jack Black thing. Go sing, go be awesome, go do some karate kicks into cameras and have a great time. He seems to have so much fun with this role. This ride is one of my favorite things at Universal too. <laughs> I love the DreamWorks <laughs> Theater ride of this. I think these are really cute films. They're really, really fun. And it's one of those things too where it's definitely an all audiences thing. There's always jokes for adults in there as well as for the kiddos. So it's a good time. I will admit that because I wasn't a huge fan of three, I kind of mm -hmm. felt, I didn't hate it, but I kind of felt like, fine. okay, this thing has run out of steam now. Yeah. And so when they first announced there was going to be Kung Fu Panda 4, I was like, mm, not really going to be on my radar. And then we were in Las Vegas last year and Jack Black came out on stage and, and he said, was fabulous. and said, you know, we don't have a trailer for this yet. So I'm going to act out a two minute promo for this movie. And he's jumping around over on stage, narrating a trailer in our mind. Wearing a jacket that is very reminiscent of Poe's colors, which yes. has been his thing lately too. Like he had that really cool jacket for when he went to the Super Mario Brothers movie. He has this. I love that he's doing this. I love that he's matching his characters. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to a question is for you guys. Are you into Kung Fu Panda? Are you interested about seeing Kung Fu Panda 4? I'm encouraged by what we're hearing from the reactions. Does it move the needle for you? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move into this, shall we? Uh, if you've watched me for any period of time, you know what I'm going to say. The Bret Hart of acting, the excellence of execution, the best there is, the best there was, the best there will ever be, the GOAT, Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, of course, he retired a couple of years ago after the movie The Phantom Thread, really too young to retire. And I, and I know many others, have been always kind of holding out hope that at some point the bug is going to get him. The bug is going to get him, and he'll come back. Well, apparently, that ain't going to happen. Even though he's had about well, four years now to four or five years to sit and think about it, uh, his My Left Foot and Other Films director, Jim Sheridan, was asked about it, about the possibility of him coming back. And this is what his uh, old director said. He says he's done. I keep talking to him, Jim Sheridan told Screen Daily on the topic of Day-Lewis staying retired. I'd love to do something with him again. He's like everybody else. 
He opens the streamers, and there's 7,000 choices, and none of them are good. Uh, film has been moved out of the public domain into a private domain. You have a remote. You can stop it. It's not the same experience. It'd be great to see Daniel come back and doing something because he's so good. So apparently, people like me are just going to have to get used to the fact that the greatest of all time is probably not going to be coming back. I, I want to put this in perspective, though, for you. From 1990 to when Daniel Day-Lewis did his final film, The Phantom Thread, which he also got a Best Lead Actor nomination for, Daniel Day-Lewis appeared in 13 movies with six Best Lead Actor nominations. That's nearly a one best lead actor nomination for every two times he appears in a movie. Over that span, he won three SAG Awards, four BAFTAs, three Critics' Choice, and three Academy Awards for best lead actor, which worked out to a rough ratio of about one to four. For every four films Daniel Day-Lewis appears in, he wins best lead actor. He's the Meryl Streep of men. He's the he really super, is. But his ratio One is day, even maybe higher. He'll be as good as her. Yeah. But his ratio is even higher. That's the crazy thing. One to two, like every two movies he appears in, he gets a Best Actor nomination. And one to four, for every four films, he wins Best Actor. He's and he's like, look, I still contend to this day that these not the single best movie, but the single best performance I have ever seen in any film ever is him in There Will Be Blood. I, again, I'm not saying it's the best movie of all time, but I'm saying I don't think I have ever seen in any movie any performance better than him in that film. I, I, I just been floored. And then you look at what he did with, you know, in Lincoln, and you look what he did in My Left Foot, and I still watch Last of the Mohicans. I mean, the, the guy is just the greatest there has ever been. And I hate the fact, because when they announced he was retiring, I probably, like everybody, thought, Oh, I hope this isn't a health issue. Like, I hope he's not sick. I hope he's not whatever. But, and I kind of thought in the back of my head that was it, even though they weren't saying it publicly. To know that, oh no, he's perfectly good. He just doesn't want to be in the business anymore. That breaks my heart because he's the best to ever do it. And I would love to see him come back, but it sounds like it's really a done deal because Chris, we live in a celebrity age mm -hmm. where Jay-Z says, oh, I'm, this is going to be my last album, five albums later. Yeah. And uh, with Soderbergh saying, okay, this is my last movie, four movies later, and all this kind of stuff. And Quentin Tarantino says his next movie is going to be his last. By 2030, we're going to have another Quentin Tarantino movie. But he said he was retiring, and it seems like he stayed retired. What do you make of this? I mean, I don't feel like he's the kind of dude who'd go back on his word. He seems very happy <laughs> yeah. not being in the Cobbling spotlight. Shoes. He seems honest here. Yeah. <laughs> Get it? Get uh -huh. out. Uh -huh. Get out. Well, and isn't he isn't he in Italy working as like a as a like making shoes? No, or he's, like he's, he's a he loves shoe cobbling. cobbling. Yeah, he's a shoe cobbler. He's cobbling <laughs> shoes now. He, he loves making shoes. He's a really I'm little a shoe. elf. Man. I'm making well, a shoes. shoes. He's a really tall Keebler elf. Like he just wants to make shoes. And By the way, that was a nice great time. Italian, uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect well, Italian. It's, it's like one of my uncles. And see, if my Lady Gaga had worked for him, I would have liked her dang movie. All right, that was beautiful. Yeah, he he's cobbling shoes. Let him live. Man, how much it. how much you guys think the shoes cost? Like made by Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> like are they like Nike like, collectible honestly, ones? Like I I'm 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 so tempted to go on eBay and see if there's a Daniel Day Lewis shoe. Where can you find Daniel Day Lewis? They're not they're not basketball sneakers. I can tell you that. I know, though. but still, just his hands on those. Shoes. I think they're oh, called I get D it. they're called D Louis. <laughs> D Louis. <laughs> Ray's not impressed. <laughs> Louis. You've been trying to pee Willie everything, and, <laughs> and none of them is working for me. D. Louis, I'd put good D. money. I'd buy some shoes. D. Louis. God. Damn right, I put those on my Don't feet. Don't you start, man. Anyway, guys, question <laughs> is for you. What do you think about that? I mean, like, come on, wouldn't it be awesome? To wake up and find out like there's a new Star Wars movie and Daniel Day Lewis was going to be the lead, or there's going to be a new Marvel film, and Daniel Day Lewis is going to be the lead, or something like that. I, ah. Uh, but apparently it's never going to happen. Questions for you guys. What do you think? Whatever you think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts.
All right, guys. With that down, we still got to talk about House of the Dragon is now coming sooner than I thought it was going to be coming. Season two's upon us. Doom Part 2 has deleted scenes, but they will never see the light of day. Uh, director Denis Villeneuve explains why. And a couple of movie theater chains up in Canada have quietly, kind of sneakily, Increase their ticket prices just for Dune 2 because they're evil. We're going to discuss that stuff and a whole bunch more. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank the sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at Factor. We want to take a second and thank a sponsor of today's video, Factor. You know, guys, some days it's great to prepare your own meal, but some days it's great to have wonderful, delicious meals already ready to go. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals makes eating better every day easy. Wherever tomorrow takes you, be ready with pre-prepared, chef-crafted, and dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. You'll have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. They've got snacks, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. And guys, you get to save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. So guys, head to factormeals.com slash camp Campia50 and use the code Campia50 to get 50% off. That's code Campia50 at factormeals.com slash Campia50 to get 50% off. And thank you to our friends at Factor for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. Uh, Ray went on a big hunt looking for the D. Louis and <laughs> the D. Days. There, there we go. The, the, you know what? Those, Those look, look really cute. good. Those are some handsome shoes. Those are some good looking shoes. I know. Yeah. I would I would have some D Louis on my feet. Yeah. But they've gotta has they got they gotta embroider D Louis on them. Yeah. I think that's the only good way to do it. Stop Otherwise, how will that. the people know? <laughs> how will people know exactly? All right. With that down, guys, let's move on with this, shall we? You know, in the last year or so, there hasn't been a show to come out that I was really curious to see how people would respond to it. The Game of Thrones spinoff series or prequel series, if you will, House of the Dragon. Because while some people, like me, know that the final couple seasons of Game of Thrones were brilliant, yeah. uh, there was a lot of people, to be fair, that d were very, to be mild about it, underwhelmed by the last couple seasons and talked a lot of trash and whatever. And, and uh, honestly... You know, when they first announced they're doing House of the Dragon, a lot of people proclaimed, no chance. I'm not giving that anything. I already got burned on the last couple of seasons of, Lord, of Game of Thrones. I'm not going to even try it, blah, blah, blah. So I was really curious to see, would we like it? If Will it be bad? Will it be good? But some people still won't give it a chance. Like, what's going to happen? And then House of the Dragon debuted. And most of us, I think it's fair to say, were blown away blown away by the series and it just kept rolling all the way through its incredible finale uh, i i say i'm not going to say that the show is as good as game of thrones overall but i think the first season of house of the dragon is better than the first season of game of thrones just just a season to, to season comparison mm -hmm. um but it was just phenomenal now we also got our hearts broken finding out we'd have to wait longer than a traditional television show for the next season to come, but it is upon us. As a new report out of Variety is confirming that it's coming in June. This comes to us from Variety who writes, House of the Dragon Season 2 will debut on HBO in June. Warner Brothers Discovery Streaming and Gaming Chief uh, J.B. Uh, Peretti revealed the launch uh, a month uh, last, let's try this again, revealed the launch month for the second season of the Game of Thrones spinoff during an interview at Morgan Stanley Technology Media and Telecom Conference on Monday. Now, they did not give a specific day, but they told us it is coming in June. And I'll tell you what, uh, right now is a good time to be a TV fan because we've got Shogun, which is one of the greatest things I've ever seen. We're only two episodes in, so maybe it goes south. But And the new episode drops today, right? For I, Shogun? Uh, I think the new episode drops today. Anyway, super stoked Tuesdays? about that. I'm not sure. And Game of Thrones coming now in just a couple of months. And between Game of Thrones, The Last of Us, uh, which I also, they're filming right now. I can't wait for that show to return. 
And of course, Shogun, it's a really good time. But Chris, I was completely blown away by that first season of House of the Dragon. Mm -hmm. It delivered on all the potential that I think people thought it would have being a Game of Thrones follow-up. Sure. And it just, without, you know, some of the weaknesses that, then again, they're only in the first season. We'll see if weaknesses manifest. But what did you think about the first season in general? And, you know, we've seen a lot of things start strong that then start to struggle and get weaker. I mean, they lost their showrunner, their main showrunner, mm -hmm. one of their co-showrunners going into this season, but they still have a lot of people who worked on season one for season two. So how did you feel about the first season? How are you feeling going into a second season? I really enjoyed the first season. I mean, we've talked a lot on the show about how it's basically succession with dragons. It's right. <laughs> a, a really wonderful look. And more killing. And more killing. Yeah. It, it's a great look at familial drama of conquest. Um, when Rob and I were doing the after shows, we were always talking about how one of the things the original games, Game of Thrones did a lot was what I call sex position, right? They had to show you something tantalizing on screen so you didn't get bored with the narrative of what was happening. Mm. And I feel like this show was, we still have that. We still have some of that in there. It's still HBO, right? Or Max, or whatever you want to call it. But I think this show also understands that its viewers are intelligent and will sit around and listen to a war council thing <laughs> without seeing tits. They figured that out, I'd say, after like two seasons. Yeah, it then took it a stopped, while. They stopped. Yeah. yeah. We still would have like a brothel yeah, scene yeah, yeah, yeah. to get through some exposition, sure. right? But there was a lot of just agency for all these characters, too. We saw people taking possession of their own power, possession of their own bodies in some people's cases. It was a really powerful series, I felt. Lots of feet. Lots, nice, of nice, lots of feet. Lots of feet. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice exposition on feet. There was a lot of that. If she only could get on Feet Finder, oh my gosh. I'll tell you Alex what. Could be doing we've great. seen a lot of questionable stuff on TV. I don't, I don't know that there's much I've seen on TV that has disturbed me as much as that scene in season one with the feet. Like, oh, that was John, I need to show you my DMs. <laughs> oh, it was very disturbing. To I, I saw that scene and went, oh, I feel seen. I feel <laughs> so seen with what this woman's going through. Y'all nasty. Um, I am a little concerned going into the second season just because I feel like we could have some sort of tonal shift with a new showrunner coming over. Right. And and that's too what we expected. Somebody else is going to put their own pizzazz on this. I'm just hoping we don't deviate too much from what we have, from what's worked here, because what I've loved, this is a great example of this, those long tension building scenes. I really love these single locations. Let's build all the tension we possibly can for one scene that is going to erupt into some violence. And I think this show does that so beautifully and wonderfully. Everything just looks so epic. It's styled so well. The acting is beautiful. The, the writing is phenomenal. I really hope that we have a sophomore season that is spectacular, not a slump. You know, I one of the things I recognize, too, that they really made sure they came out of the gate strong with, because one of the criticisms, as beloved as the first few seasons of Game of Thrones were, one of the first criticisms, and South Park Ray even did an episode about it. It's like, you know, there are going to be dragons at some point, right? <laughs> yeah. And they, they go to George R.R. R. Martin. It's like, when are we going to get the dragons? It's been a couple of years. And that's, of course, where we got one of the greatest songs on TV. <laughs> wiener, flaccid wiener. But anyway, uh, they came right out of the gate with dragons. <laughs> I mean, we got a lot of dragons in this and the promise for more moving forward. I cannot wait for this show to return. And, of course, we got our new Supergirl came out of this show. Yeah, Season one. Uh, so it'll what, was, be what was great about the show is the last... Uh, TV series I remember that we actually took as an event. It yeah, was well, like an we event. got together every week. Early, yeah. early too. Had some barbecue sometimes. Had some, we set up for this show, so I can't wait for this premiere. Yeah, it's going to be great. I, I'm so excited. And I'm so, I thought it was going to be later than, in the year than this. And to be honest, with the way everything gets bumped, I even kind of thought I might get bumped to 2025, but I'm so glad it's coming out in just a couple of months. How do you guys feel about it? Are you looking forward to season two? Maybe you didn't like the first season. That's totally fair. I loved it. Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. That down. Let's uh, talk about this, shall we? You know, one of the fun things about physical media, and I'm, I'm not really a physical media guy anymore, but one of the fun things about physical media is going into the bonus chapters and looking up outtakes or deleted scenes, right? Deleted scenes are always fun. But I remember some time ago, it might've still been back in the AMC days, I had a little bit of a debate about should something that's in a deleted scene be considered canon to whatever the movie is? 
And I can't remember who I was discussing this with. Somebody was trying to make the arguments that, yes, it should be considered canon. canon. And I was like, no, like to me, if a movie, if a scene gets cut out of the movie, it's as if it never happened. It, it doesn't exist. It's not in the movie. It's not a part of the movie, blah, blah, blah. Well, with a movie the length of Dune Part 2, like two hours and 40 some odd minutes, <laughs> you know they're going to be deleted scenes. Denis Villeneuve's talked about some. We even know like a couple of the actors from the first one did have scenes in the second one, but they got cut out. Uh, for the sake of the film. And maybe there are some people who are already looking forward to seeing the deleted scenes of Dune Part 2. Well, don't hold your breath, because according to Denis Villeneuve, we're never going to see them. And he explains why. This comes to us from The Hollywood Reporter, where Denis says the following, I am a strong believer that when it's not in the movie, it's dead. The director said when asked if he will release deleted scenes from the film uh, for its upcoming Blu-ray release. Sometimes I remove shots and I say, I cannot believe I'm cutting this out. I feel like a samurai opening my gut. It's painful, so I cannot go back after that and create a Frankenstein and try to reanimate things that I killed. It's too painful. When it's dead, it's dead. And it's dead for a reason. But yes, it is a painful proj a project, but it is my job. The movie prevails. I love this statement. You know, it reminds me a lot, I've mentioned this one before too, of something that um, in uh, a why Braveheart, Mel Gibson's uh, director's commentary on Braveheart, he talks in the director's commentary about there are scenes that I cut out of this movie. And he said, it's like killing one of your own children because he said, literally there was a scene that we worked on for like four weeks of setup, you know, relocating everything, got in there just to shoot this one scene. We literally spent weeks doing it. And then as I was watching it in the editing room and we're putting the movie together, I realized the movie was just going to flow better if we took this scene out. And he says, it kills you. But there are so many directors today that, and you know what? I'm going to say, I love Bradley Cooper. I love Bradley Cooper. But one, especially as a director, he's been directing now, but one of the things that I think is one of his weaknesses that we've seen in the couple of films he's directed is that he gets too attached to the scenes he's shot. Both the movies that he's directed that I've seen, there's been, they've been very good, but at the same time, it's like, you got to be willing to make the hard decisions and cut certain things out for the overall movie. And I love when Denise says the movie prevails. The movie comes first. The overall flow comes first. And I remember seeing in... Um, a Star is Born and in a Maestro, like great movies that really needed some stuff cut out and they just feel like they birthed these scenes. Directors feel like we did that. Peter Jackson even. I love Peter Jackson. But when you watch his Kong movie, it's like, yeah, Peter, you probably, you got to be willing to cut things out. For And you know what? After watching Dune, Dune 2, like, whatever Denis did to cut things out, it worked because the movie's a masterpiece and it's absolutely incredible. So, am I bummed that I won't get to see the scenes that got deleted? Yes. As a fan, I would like to see them, just for fun. But I also kind of respect Denis' kind of approach to this of saying, listen, once something doesn't make it in the movie, it doesn't exist to him. And I can respect that, even though I, as a fan, would love to see it. Anyway, Chris, you read Denise's comments here. How do you interpret that? It's very dramatic because it's what, Seppuku or Seppuku? Seppuku? Seppuku the, yeah, that Seppuku he's a, that Samurai he's kills himself. The, yeah. Um, and I just finished Blue Eyed Samurai. So I was like, oh, hmm. I don't think it's How like good that, was sir. that, by the way? Oh, my gosh. It's How so good. How good is Blue Eyed Samurai? So good. <laughs> How dare any of you, though? No one in this room told me about the eye violence. Only my dear friend Tanya LaHue gave me a time stamp. I'm positive. The first time I told you that I was watching it, I said, there's going to be a part that you might get a little Receipt squeamish at. Timeline. There might be. Okay. <laughs> but it was really, really great. Uh, back to Denny, though. Uh, I do respect this. I think this is really fantastic to kind of stick by this model here because you can't be too precious with your stuff. With with art, it's really hard to not get married to your choices. We have to do this with acting of not being so set on the way you saw the scene, but once you have the director come in or the writer come in, taking their notes and taking what they do. And you need to listen to your editors too. I think mm. movies die on whether or not they have a great editor. and you really have to listen to those cuts that make sense for the story to prevail because you're always in service to the story, nothing else. Not your ego, not how one of your actors looks, none of that, it's always to the story. So I think this is a very admirable thing. Am I sad? 
yeah, I love extra features. I love bonus me features. Too. So they better give me some other fun stuff. But I think it's a great kind of thing to, to live by. And also, I love that he's saying this now so we can just put a real quick kibosh on people going, well, where's the director's cut? I want to see that one since right. we live in such an age of, but I know this isn't the real movie, the full movie. The real movie is what makes it to theaters, folks. Release I agree, the 100%. Cut. Yeah, release the Denis cut. Oh, what goes to your theaters <laughs> is what the movie the is. This was the Denis cut. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I love even more, though? And I, I, want, I don't know why they don't do more of this because it doesn't take up a lot of data on discs. I want multiple commentary tracks. I've, I've had a couple of discs where, first of all, I love director's commentaries. It gives you an insight into the film like no other. But I've had a couple of discs where they had a director's commentary, and then they had a commentary from the two lead actors. Mm -hmm. And then they, because it's not like you put another entire copy of the movie on, it's just matching a different audio track with it. And I would love in this movie to have a Denis audio track, like a commentary track, to have a Timothy and Zendaya together track, and like have a Javier Bardem and Josh Brolin together track. That'd be super fun. Uh, like I would, I would love to see that, but I would also, I, I will admit I'll, I'll miss seeing what the deleted scenes might've been to mm. just kind of imagine a dream about what might've been in the movie. But uh, anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about that? I mean, we're not going to get deleted scenes. And what do you think of Denise's rationale for that? Saying, hey, listen to me, once it's not in the movie, it's dead and it's gone. I agree with them, but I still kind of like seeing them as a fan. But anyway, how do you feel about it? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? There's a, a movie theater chain in Canada. It is the predominant movie theater chain. Like, it, to give comparison, it's just like if AMC and Regal were together. That's how big of a dominance that Cineplex has in Canada. It's if you want to go to a movie in Canada, the the odds are you're going to be going to a Cineplex. There are a couple of others, there are, but they they almost have an uh, almost have a monopoly up there. And I'll tell you what, I used to love Cineplex. Used to love it. Actually, once I came down to the states and I started running things for AMC theaters, it was actually my dream that someday I would go back to Canada and do the same sort of thing for Cineplex. It was my dream. Uh, I spent so much of my growing up years in Cineplex cinemas. Like I spent a lot of hours of my life in Cineplex cinemas. This is where I fell in love with the movies. But they've become garbage. They're vile. Um, they have, I mean, basically they might have, see that sign says Cineplex cinemas? It might as well say right underneath it, Hey, consumers, we hate you, and we don't care if you know it, because what else are you going to do? Um, I, and I remember I started following a lot of the stuff. They I won't go over everything, but started following some of the stuff they were doing that was so anti-consumer, and I started getting really disappointed. And then I remember going home one year and taking my mom to go see a movie, and I think it was Aquaman. Yeah, it was. I wanted to take her to see Aquaman and realizing, you know, they – they charge you huge extra fees to see it in a premium format, whether it's one of their premium screens or if it's a 3D showing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't like any of that nonsense. I'm just going to take my mom to a regular screening. I kid you not, with, without exaggeration, I went on when I was in Canada, went on the Cineplex app. I tried to find a screening for it. Out of the, like the four theaters playing it, there was one 4.30 in the afternoon screening that wasn't a 3D screening. Everything else, they were forcing you. You want to come see Aquaman? <laughs> you got to pay the uh, extra three and a half bucks for the uh, 3D premium. But I don't want it. Too bad. Well, then come at 4.30 in the afternoon. Like, it, it just it's just that kind of stuff. They've really come to disgust me. I really hate that theater chain. And I, I kind of, I resent the fact now that when I go up there, that's the only choice I have. And this new situation with Dune 2 is yet just another example of this. It's being reported in the Canadian media that, oh, look, we're, uh, when a reporter noticed that when they went to go buy tickets for Dune 2, they realized, oh, wait, that ticket is more expensive than, say, a ticket for Madam Web. Wait, what's going on? And then they started doing some cross-referencing. And by the way, it wasn't just Cineplex. There's another theater chain in Canada called Landmark, which I don't know if they're related at all to the Landmark that's down in the States or not. 
that they were doing it too. But but we're focusing on Cine, Cineplex here. It's like they're charging more. Why are you charging more? And the audacity, the, the reporter reached out to Cineplex and the audacity of their rep said, well, you know, we've done this for years. It's no different than when we charge different prices for time of day. You mean matinees? Yeah, this is different than that. And it's no different from when we charge for this. And basically, they just blew it off. <laughs> and listen, I remember, this reminds me a lot of when AMC and other theaters were going to experiment with uh, charging you more for premium seats. Like, if you get the seat the best seats in the movie theater, you're going to pay a little extra. But don't worry, they would say, if you get one of the worst seats in the theater, we'll charge you less. Remember that? That zone seating thing? Right. And what did I say when they first now Before they rolled it out, I said, this is a lie. This is just them using this as a pretext to raise prices. Because I said, I guarantee you this is what's going to happen. They're going to take... 40 seats and increase the price on 40 of the seats and they'll take like 10 of the seats that are really bad and reduce it a little bit. But I said, overall, when you average out the price of all the seats in that theater, I guarantee you it's more per seat. I 100% guarantee you. And what happened when they finally rolled it out? Remember we brought up the seating chart and everything? And we showed you. It was exactly that. It was just a big lie. It was a pretext to raise prices and pretend like you were getting something good out of it. Yeah, you got to pay $1 less for the worst seat for 10 or 12 of those seats, but like 40 of the other seats raised their prices by buck fifty. It was a lie. They said, oh, don't worry, like it's all going to even out. It never did. And to anybody who would say to me, well, you know, John, with movies, which by the way, the, the movie theater is supposed to be the great equalizer. You go to see the newest small indie film, say the average price is 10 bucks. I'm just for argument's sake. You pay 10 bucks. You're going to see the newest Marvel film. You pay 10 bucks. I mean, that's what it was supposed to be. And them saying like, oh, well, for these movies, are going to raise prices. Okay. Well, are you going to take Madam Web that nobody's going to go see? And are you going to lower the prices on those then to compensate? Oh, no, no, no. We're not going to do that. Oh, so you're just using this as a pretext to fuck over the consumers more. I want to ask these movie theater chains, are you so stupid? The movie theaters, which is my church, okay? That's where I go to church. That's my holy ground is movie theaters. I love going to movie theaters. I love movie theater companies. But they're also idiots. Like you do realize, or are you too stupid to understand that right now movie theaters are fighting for their lives and the main thing that you as movie theaters need to be doing right now is winning back the audience. Make people fall in love with coming back to the movie theater. Not just for the movies on the screen itself, but also for the overall experience of coming to the movies. You should be in a phase right now where you are doing everything you can to make coming to the movies as appealing as possible. And when you pull these dirtbag piece of shit moves, it's like, oh, 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 now there's a movie you're really excited to see. We're going to charge you more. Fuck you. <laughs> you. There is nobody right now. It's not streamers. It's not video games. The number one group responsible for the threat to the existence of movie theaters is fucking movie theaters. They are their own biggest threat because they fuck everything up. And I get passionate about this because I have spent so much of my life in love with this one particular theater chain. They were my dream. I, and I'm not even, I'm not, I, this is not hyperbole when I say this. I would talk to, with Anne at night about how my dream is that we're going to get to go back to Canada and I'll do what I'm doing for AMC at Cineplex. That was my dream. And it's not limited to Cineplex. We've off, I've often lamented about some of the ass backwards but fucking stupid things that I've seen AMC theaters do that I've seen other uh, a theater chain I worked with for many years and I have a great special place in my heart for them. I really do despite my criticisms. But when I watch these stewards of our movie going experiences, 
being the ones who are the most clueless, it's frustrating to me as a film fan. You guys know how passionate I am about the movie going experience. I love going to the movies, guys. I love it. It's my favorite fucking thing in the world to do. And when I see, and, and, and I'll get angry when I see somebody threatening it, but when it's the theaters themselves threatening it, making it more unappealing, Cineplex should be looking at this and saying, hey, there's Dune 2 now. People are going to love to come. Instead of saying, let's roll out the red carpet. Let's make sure this is the best experience they have. Let's make it as easy for them to come in that. No, you know what they did instead? People want to see Dune 2? Awesome. Let's fuck them. Let's fuck them. Yeah. You idiots. If the movie theater, and I'm, I'm by no means convinced like some people are, that the movie theaters go, I, I listen, last 20 years I've been hearing people say every day, movie theaters are going to be gone in the next three or four years. I've been hearing people say that for 20 years. I don't believe that. But if in the next three or four years, movie theaters disappear, it'll say on their tombstone, murdered by movie theaters. Here lies movie theaters, murdered by movie theaters. And they got no one else to blame. Anyway, Chris, that's my over-emotional response to what I've just seen. <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts on all this? <laughs> I mean, they're clawing at every dollar they can get. They've had so many financial issues. They had that whole case, right, with Cineworld specifically. Yeah, yeah, where so, they were gonna they, they were gonna be acquired by mm -hmm. Cineworld, the owners of Regal and stuff like that. Yeah. And so that happened with uh, they were selling part of their business, trying to recoup money and everything. They filed for uh, some reliefs that they did not get. So, like any business. I can understand trying to raise that bottom line so that you can recoup some of that money and not go full Michael Scott. That said, this is some bullshit. It really is, especially when they've been reached for comment from the Globe and other people of saying, oh, all of our, our customers are fully aware that they are being charged for this, you know, that they have this. It makes me feel, follow me on this journey, it makes me feel like it's similar to the Wendy surge pricing. Yeah, I don't get uh, that. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's just stupid. That's going to fall on its face. Yeah, of, okay, well, then I can just go to another movie theater yeah. and see it for less money. Or, okay, well, I guess I'm going to go to McDonald's. Yeah, okay. sorry you came at this point. We're going to charge you more. I'll yeah. cancel my order. I'll exactly. Do it. You're charging me more and I don't get any incentives? Well, then, okay, bye. I'm not doing this. <laughs> because this is an audio medium, I just gave the finger. Um, I don't understand why they thought this would be a smart move. And I understand it's just, you know, a few bucks here. But still, your consumer is smart and you want to create a loyal consumer. You want to have a great customer experience for that consumer so they only go to your theaters. You know, there is a tribalism that we have with them here. I go to Regal all the time. I love going to Regal. I like my Regal points. I love their system. You guys I know are A-list folks. You do AMC. That works for you. It makes sense for you. You want to create an environment that makes your consumer want to specifically go to you. This is the opposite. Yeah. It's not smart. Um, I I just, I can't, I, I just, yeah. I'm going to resist the, uh, the temptation to say some of the other things on my mind. Ooh. I'm going to hold back on that. Anyway, guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? The idea of, uh, hey, we're going to, you know, raise prices on some, but we're not going to bounce that out by lowering prices on others. No, anyway, and this whole thing about, I saw that comment where they said, our audience is full aware. Really? Because so you're saying if I go to the, to the ticket purchase price right now, there's not going to be a notification saying, uh, you know, notice you will be paying more for this ticket than if you go to see another movie. Because if you don't, shut up. Anyway, whatever you guys think about this, jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's get on to the most important part of our show here, shall we? Which is hearing from you guys, your thoughts, theories, opinions, and observations. And as long as it's appropriate to be addressed on our show, we'll address it now. So, Chris, what do we got up here first? From Connor Not Found, sending in a $10 super chat. Love you guys so much. I'm going to be watching you live with a few blunts tonight. I'm very excited <laughs> for the future of Talk to Me. I think it's one of the most creative horror concepts in recent memory. It's a very, you know what? Uh, the last couple of years, um, we've had a, an influx of some really creative, lower budget, but really nice little horror films uh, come out. And I, for, what time is it in the UK right now? Just because you mentioned. I'm guessing watch, like seven. Really? So seven hours like ahead. prime time in the UK? Mm -hmm. All right. like seven hours ahead. So it's 8.19 p.m. Oh, eight hours ahead. 8.19 p.m. Perfect time. Mm -hmm. for to blaze thing. it. His Highness Charles is sitting up, getting ready for bed, watching 
The John Campier show, I can see it now. His, um, his Highness Connor is doing it too. Yeah. <laughs> his his highness. Yeah. I highness. Go thanks, I thanks, got guys. it. Um <laughs> But yeah, it's been a really good kind of run for some horror films lately, and uh, that was definitely one of the creative ones. All right, what's next? From Damaris Love, raising ticket prices, that's a paddling. <laughs> that's a Simpsons thing. It's talking in class, that's a paddling. For, for <laughs> yeah, only Simpsons fans will get that reference. Again, listen, I don't want to sound like I'm unsympathetic. Like, I, I have worked in the movie theater industry. I understand there are razor thin margins. I get it. Do I believe me? I often defend movie theaters about stuff like that. But it's this type of underhanded, like, you know, creepiness that just turns people off. And when you get somebody who is the biggest fan of movie theaters, me, getting this upset. Listen, I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot of other people out there, potential moviegoers who's going, oh, I'm not going to bother then. I'll just wait. I'll just wait. And, and that's what I mean by it's the theaters who are killing themselves right now. All right, what's next? From Kevin sending in a $100 super chat. Oh. Kevin. Damn. Thank Hi, you, Kevin. man. We're going to rename an episode of the show to you. This, to, this <laughs> episode is officially the John Campia Show podcast brought to you by Kevin. You're an executive producer now, bud. You're an executive producer <laughs> now. Thank you, Kevin, for supporting us on that level, dude. Hey, John and crew. Kevin here. Big fan since 2016. Thank you, man. I'm making a short Damien Wayne film, a uh, fan film, and have a teaser out for it. Do you guys have any advice? I hope you get to check it out. The best advice I have, you know, from from as a fan film, is really just to make sure contact as many um, webmasters. That's a phrase we don't hear used very many people who run the administrators of a lot of other fan websites, particularly of DC fan sites, comic uh, fan sites. Uh, send them links to your thing. See if you can maybe even write up a little press release. Write up a little press release. Get as many as the uh, contact information for a lot of the fan sites. Send it out. Hopefully, you know, some people will pick it up and want to feature it on their website or something like that. That's kind of the, the best advice that I have. As somebody who doesn't have a ton of experience making fan films, I did make one. We won some awards. It was really great. Got me a trip to Lucasfilm. Um, but yeah, that's the best thing. Reach out. Find those websites. Go to their contact us section, write up something that kind of looks like a little bit of a press release, send it out to those guys, and maybe it'll get picked up. And uh, best of luck with that. And again, thank you for, for sponsoring us on that or supporting us on that level, man. That's incredibly generous of you. And thank you for being around for eight years, man. I appreciate you very much. All right. What's next? From Sanchez Guy. Hey, guys, since you haven't heard, the first trailer for DreamWorks The Wild Robot just dropped today, and it looks great. You were just talking about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just telling Chris. I said, have you seen The Wild Robot trailer? And she had, because I think she's going to like it. Um, pull it away and watch it. On, on one hand, it's not <laughs> a great trailer because I, they don't give you any indication of what the story is. Like, we just see a robot walking around the woods, basically. And there's not even any dialogue in it till like, really close to the end of it. That said, as I'm watching the first 20, 30 seconds of this trailer, I'm like, it's, this is just like some robot walking around in the forest, whatever. But, man, by the end of it, it was pretty sweet. And I, I mean sweet, literally. Like it was, it was a, there was a sweetness to it. It was really, really sweet. And, you know, there's a scene where, it, like, oh, the robot, they just show you a quick little thing. A robot finds an egg. And then you see this little chick following robot around. And then by the end of the trailer, the robot looks up in the sky and there's a migration happening with birds. And the one adult bird looks back at the robot and the robot gets sadness in its eyes because it's the little chick that's flying away. It was really sweet. And uh, I remember thinking, Chris is going to love this. She's going to eat this up. I'm it's watching it right now. It's so cute. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. <laughs> it looks. Yeah. So he's chasing a turtle. Oh, God. <laughs> it's if you guys haven't seen this trailer yet uh it, it's it's pretty nice it's a nice little one all right what's next from raymond verada sad to hear brother son won't have a second season uh, i'm watching it now american-born chinese too both michelle yo sh shows i like it not house of the dragon shogun last of us level uh, but the brother's son S-U-N. The Brother's Son is so fun. I really enjoyed Right from the first episode, 
Uh, I love the, the, the big brother. I love the little brother, Michelle Yeoh rules. Um, I, man, I, and when it ended, I'm like, I can't wait for season two. I cannot wait for season two. Um, and to find out, but listen, Hey, it's Netflix, you know, but, and because I didn't even know this show existed until it dropped, you know, Anne was the one that said, Hey, this, this new Michelle Yeoh show. I'm like, like uh, American born Chinese. She goes, no, no, another one. It's called the brother's son. Should we check it out? I'm like, I never even heard of it. Okay. So it's not a big surprise. It, you know, I was saying this before, Chris, um, I've not had anybody write to me to tell me they're watching it or anything mm. like that. So even though I really liked it and I tried to tell people it was good, did you watch it? I did. I what? haven't finished it. I really liked it, though. Oh, yeah, I enjoyed it's it a lot. It's really, really fun. And I'm bummed. It was, uh, like you, though, it was one of those things of, wait, Michelle Yeoh has a show on here? I had no idea. Yeah, and she's really good in it. Mm -hmm. All right, what's next? From DJ Infa Desert Eagle International. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. In your passionate defense of Lord of the Rings versus MCU, you missed my question, which was, is Dune 2 now the greatest cinema achievement? No. No, it's still it's still Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Uh, again, I'm not saying Lord of the Rings Return of the King is the better movie. I'm not saying it's not either. But when I talk about Lord of the Rings Return of the King being the single greatest achievement, I'm talking about like when you look at all the disciplines that go into making a film, I've never seen one film where every single discipline was so nailed. Again, not that it's the greatest film of all time, but I've never seen a singular achievement like that in film. Dune is like, Dune 2 is likened unto that. But in that category, I would still give the little bit of the edge to Lord of the Rings Return of the King. But again, ask me again in a year, because I might have a different perspective then. All right, what's next? From Raymond Verrata again. My thoughts on Facebook, Instagram threads, WhatsApp outage. People thought they were hacked. Meta has a self-destruct button to blow it all up. I I was, uh, I didn't experience this because I'm only on my Instagram once or twice a day. Like once or twice a day, I'll check it. And that's because the main reason I check it even twice a day is because my wife sends me like 15 reels a day mm -hmm. that you know, she'll text me. What did you think about that thing I sent you? It's like, I haven't seen it yet. You don't love me. You know, that sort of thing. So <laughs> I have to check that. But I saw it on, uh, I saw CNN write a headline that Facebook and Instagram is down. I thought, oh, this is going to tee off a lot of people. I didn't even notice it. Any of you guys notice it was down? I just couldn't refresh my page and went, oh, okay, and logged off. And then it was really hilarious watching a bunch of people panic <laughs> and have their stories afterwards i thought that i was getting shadow banned i thought that something was happening to me i thought i was getting blocked on this app thank god that's not the case how long was it down a few minutes yeah because when think i read it was the that long it was this morning i was getting ready to come into the office and i saw the story i thought oh i'll check mine and i opened up facebook and it had logged me out i had to re-log back in something i haven't had to do in a long time but but it worked so i couldn't have been down for too long anyway all right, what's next? From Matan, sending in a $30 super chat. Back in 2010, Wes Ball said that Zelda needs to be the next big mocap Avatar-like movie. We maybe have found our next big event epic that comes to the levels Avatar and Dune. Have we maybe found that one? There needs to be a question uh, part that, in that. Uh, I, uh, I really doubt it. <laughs> I really doubt it. Listen, I am excited for a live-action Zelda movie. I, I'm excited for it, but... Like, a, a new Dune and a new Lord of the Rings, these are things that happen every 20 or 30 years. Like, so, look, could, listen, here's the thing. This new, this next Garfield movie coming out, it could be the next Lord of the Rings. It could be the next Godfather. The likelihood is low, but it could be. So, could Zelda? Yes, but I would say the like, look, I think Zelda's going to be, can, has the potential to be really great. I'm very excited for it. But the next Dune or Lord of the Rings, let's reel that in a little bit. Let's, let's, let's reel those kinds of expectations in a little bit. That is something that happens like uh, every generation. So let's just, I mean, could it be? Maybe, but let's, let's, let's just pump the brakes on that for now. All right. What's next? From Dr. Stinky. I've seen Dune and it's great. <laughs> Not one of the best films of all time, but good. I need to rewatch. Had a bad experience, so I'll give a full review soon. Well, if oh, you had a bad experience, I'm sorry. sure that affected things. Yeah. But I mean, listen, no, look, just because I have proclaimed that for me, it is one, may probably the best film I've seen in the last 10 years. 
Um, and it it is going to find a place in my top 10 greatest films of all time list. Where, I'm not sure yet, but it's going to be there. But that's my experience. There are going to be other people's experience who I've already had a lot of people write into me saying, no, this is now the greatest movie of all time. Okay, I respect that. Uh, there are going to be people who write and say, I didn't even like this movie. And I can respect that too. So, yes, uh, for me, it absolutely is one of the greatest films ever made. 100%. Um, where in my top 10? Not quite sure. And for you, it doesn't need to be. I mean, the only thing that matters is, did you have a good time? And as long as you liked it and had a good time, that's the only thing that really matters. All right, what's next? From Amin, didn't know about the Cineplex thing, but I hate how they have such a monopoly here in Canada. Yeah. How can they be the only major chain? I can't even boycott and go to another theater even if I wanted to. Oh, that's some bullshit. I mean, no, it's 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 tough. Like that, It horrible. is that much of a, a monopoly there. Wow. Uh, I think they said 70, a oh, little over 75. I could be, I believe this is the number. A little over 75% of the movie screens in Canada are Cineplex screens. Now, if I remember my history right, there used to be two major chains. There was Famous Players was one major chain, and Cineplex Odeon was another chain. And then at some point in my youth, the two merged and created this mega monster known as Cineplex, which was fine because it still went on to become like my most beloved place I would go. For those of you up in Ontario, the Cineplex uh, Silver City in Ancaster, that was my church. I Like, that's where I would go. It's just, that's where I spend a lot of my life. That's where I saw Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, and a lot of the other great movies that are very formative for me. Um, the problem is, when you have a monopoly of a good movie theater chain that is trying to create great movie-going experiences and be accessible to everybody, them being the monopoly is great. But like an, unto a dictatorship, when a movie theater chain goes, huh, you know what? We're not literally, but we're kind of the only game in town. We can do whatever we want. What's, what are people going to cry? What are people going to say? Nothing, because we're the only game in town. And then they start to act like they're the only game in town. In my opinion, that's exactly what Cineplex has done. And uh, they, uh, they are revolting to me for that. Anyway, all right, what's next? From, uh, oh, from DJ Infodesert uh, Eagle yeah. International again. <laughs> Sending in a $20 super chat, a 20 pound super oh, chat. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, DJ. Last one on this as time goes by and tech improves, I think we'll get a movie that passes Lord of the Rings in Dune 2. I just don't know if we'll get a series of films, 20 plus, uh, one story all linked again. 1v1, no MCU film matches up, but as a group. Well, look, here's the thing. The true brilliance of Dune isn't in the technology. Like, yeah, they may, they were able to make the Worms riding scene feel uh, like awe-inspiring and amazing, but the best parts of Dune is the narrative, the story, the dialogue, the characters. Like, that's what elevates it from just being a spectacle to being a truly great motion picture. You know, when you look at something like Oppenheimer, yeah, you got the one nuclear explosion soon, scene, okay. But it, but Oppenheimer is a scene, is a movie of a collection of scenes of dialogue. It's the powerful narrative and, and these, these rich characters that drive it. That's what elevates it. It's not the technology. That's why you can still go back today and like probably the greatest films of all time, whether you're talking about a Ben-Hur, you're talking about Lawrence of Arabia, or you're talking about The Godfather, or you're talking about whatever... Like, they didn't have the technology, but they're still, like, the greatest films of all time because they got those things right. All records are made to be broken. Whatever is the greatest film of all time today, someday another film will come along and beat it, and then someday another film will come along and beat that. It just happens very rarely. <laughs> all right, what's next? From James Germain. Hey, guys, Lex interviewed Lex today on Inside of You, and to hear Holt say, you were my first Lex Luthor, warms my heart. Keep it filthy. Oh, I really, that, he's talking about Michael Rosenbaum's Inside of You podcast, which mm -hmm. I really enjoy. He's it's a so fun. very good interviewer, mm -hmm. actually. He makes it very personal, but he asks the questions that we want to hear asked. Uh, it's very good. So to hear him interviewing Nicholas Holt, who's the new, I, I didn't know he was the latest guest, so I got to go watch that. 
uh, Rosenbaum's interview with James Gunn a few months ago was fantastic. So good. His interview with uh, with uh, Nathan Fillion a while ago too was also really fantastic. Um, so I would really want to love watching that. I would love to go back and watch that. All right, what's next? From Jay Loco, just saw Shot Caller. I'm still amazed when Brits act American street. Like Christian Bale in 2005's Harsh Times went full thug talking great Spanglish. I'm trying, which one was Shot Caller? That was last year, right? Was that 2022, 2023? I am not familiar with this film at all. It's not the one with Kevin Spacey and Jeremy Irons, right? About the housing market collapse. No, that was uh, margin call. Margin that call. was margin call. Right, right. Yeah. That's yeah. I'm thinking of margin call. I'm trying to remember which one was shot caller. Oh, now I can't remember. But by the way, a side note: if you haven't seen Margin Call, watch Margin Call. It's very, very good. All right, what's next? From Renetta W, sending in a fifty dollars super chat. Oh, thank you, Renetta. Thank you, Renetta. Saw Dune. It was fantastic. When Timothy gave his speech, the Freeman, I felt my ovaries drop in that moment. <laughs> also, just one very, very minor nitpick. When Timothy yelled to Javier on the worm, really? You can hear that? Javier, MVP of the film. Okay. So, uh, and by the way, thank you, Renetta, for supporting us on that level. It's very generous of you. I have I've seen the movie three times now, and that same thought comes to my head every single time. Because in the, uh, the, they put the clip out. You know, no, there's the scene where Paul, Timothy Chalamet, rides the worm for the first time. And when you're in the movie theater watching that, it's overwhelming with the audio because it's the rumble, like this rumble, it's loud and whatever. So there's this scene in the movie. This isn't spoiling anything. It's a casual throwaway kind of moment. Timothy Chalamet, Paul is sitting on a dune, just on a sand dune, and uh, off uh, about 200 yards away, Stilgar, Javier Bardem is riding a worm, shooting across the landscape. And Paul goes, hey, Stilgar. And Stilgar's like, whoa. It's like, and I thought to myself every single time, there is no way they'd be able to hear each other. There he is the voice. There is, yeah, he, he's Paul like, used the voice. Yeah, he's like, hey, Stilgar. <laughs> I, I mean, I just thought there is no conceivable way they actually <laughs> hear each other. And I, I am 100% with you on that, Renata. That thought crossed my mind every single time I've seen the movie and will always be there every time I watch it from now until forever. All right, what's next? From Coolio Ray Curley. In Dune 2, my guess is... Okay, I need is... to meet this person. <laughs> in Dune 2, my guess is Paul and the worm riders just had to keep going in circles until everyone could jump onto each of their worms successfully. LOL. Yeah, th th that's been... You know, I did a nearly three-hour open spoiler discussion of Dune 2 this weekend, and something a lot of people bring up. There are two big questions. How do they get off the worm? Because it looked like a pretty big ordeal. If you guys saw the clip they put out of Paul doing the first worm riding... <laughs> that sounds like a that sounds like an innuendo. But when Paul first rides the worm, um, it's a pretty big deal just to get mounted, right? Just to get on that thing, it's a big deal. And everybody, a lot of people writing, in, how do they dismount? How do they get off the worm exactly? And there's another shot in the movie where there's like 50 people on one worm, even with like a little tent riding the worm. It's like, how did they do that? Denis Villeneuve promises probably in the next movie they'll let us know, they'll show us how they do that, but it is something that has crossed our minds. All right, what's next? From Michael Brocky, just wanted to say a big thank you to Chris. I told her my concerns about staying in the industry, but now ready to get back out there. Oh, that's great, dude. Sweet. What industry? I, I'm assuming the a entertainment voice acting? industry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very. a lot of people are real freaked out right now with the rise of AI, with um, teachers yeah. in the Atsi, obviously now working on their own deals and everyone should support them just as they did the writers, the directors and the actors. Um, just uh, we're having the slowest pilot season of all time. Like nothing's greenlit. The first pilot just got greenlit for this year. Um, and so people are really worried about it. But I think a lot of people are jumping ship and uh, there's always adversity. There's always adversity in this industry, and when the tough get going, you get tougher. You know, you like you gotta you gotta stay in it. And if this isn't for you, then don't do it. You know, it's it's interesting because it's even maybe about to touch us here, because I we just had a company. I, I'm gonna let you guys know some behind the curtain stuff here that I probably shouldn't even be talking about, but I, I will because who cares? Um, we've been talking with a company that has given us a proposal. Because we're kind of half thinking about maybe starting a Spanish channel. I don't know if this is actually going to happen. But a 
John Campia podcast channel that is all in Spanish because we had this company reach out to us a while ago and show us how they could take our videos. And I got to show this to you, Chris, because they literally just sent me the sample this morning mm -hmm. where they took one of our videos and it's our video and it's my voice and it's your voice mm. only in it's Espanol? In, it's in Espanol. It's it's in Spanish. Oh. And it's the same video, right? But all in Spanish. And my first reaction is, oh, that's really cool. Because, I mean, if we could create a, a channel where Spanish-speaking people, we make it more accessible for people to watch our content. That's great and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, traditionally speaking, I mean, pre-YouTube days, but traditionally speaking, if you wanted to have your movie or television show or whatever in another language you would hire voice actors of who spoke that language and you would do dubs and all that kind of stuff and like that is now i mean which is something i would never do for something like the john campus show but the principle right is like now we can literally do the john campus show in spanish and chinese and hindi and in and whatever and, and put them out but if that's having that effect on us here like what the effect it has on the larger industry, particularly for people who do voice acting and stuff mm -hmm. like that must be frighteningly profound. We're already right feeling that with film, um, just because there's live action dubbing, right? Where you have a, you know, Israeli film and we dub it in English or something like that. Um, that's definitely starting to happen. A lot of times though, companies still want actual actors to be doing the voiceover because AI misses nuance sometimes, they miss, tone they don't have breath it sounds uncanny um and so what a big thing is having the actor match the mouth and everything mm -hmm. and match the intention of what the other actor has already decided ai doesn't always do that particularly well um anime is one of the things that should stay relatively human which is really interesting um just because it's an animated character so you'd think that would be the first thing they try to kind of fill with robots but anime actors seem to be doing doing really really well because people enjoy who do like dubs that kind of transition of english actors um, but yeah, it's, it's a little spooky. It All makes right. sense that they're doing it, but it's still spooky. What's next? Patrick Hamilton, Godzilla versus Kong tickets on sale yet. Movie is opening in a few weeks and patiently waiting to purchase my tickets. I don't know. Ray, you want to take a, take a stab at that? See I if... checked it yesterday on the AMC. It's not yet. I just okay. had a reminder. But it's not till May, right? Not April. No, it's March. Wait, it comes out in March? Uh, no. Is it in March? 29th? No. It can't be that soon. Hold it on. doesn't come out in March, does it? Hold on. Let's see. No, I got to look it up too. Uh, X Kong. Godzilla. March 29th. Wow. Okay. Really? So almost a couple April. weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good news, baby. I <laughs> Listen, one of the things we talked about this on the show yesterday, one of the things about Dune being such a masterpiece has done is this makes me excited to go back to the movies more. So, like, I came out, I'm like, when does Godzilla vs. Kong come out? When does Planet Rise of the Planet of the Apes come out? When does Deadpool 3 get? Like, I just, it makes me excited about going to the movies again. So, um, you know, some people get worried these days about like, oh my God, the tickets haven't gone on sale yet. Should we be worried? I know that's not what you're saying. I'm, I'm just, it's like, well, the movies, what day is it today? The fifth? The fifth. fifth. So it's still like three weeks, 24 days away. Yeah. I mean, so I, I don't know when the I mean, tickets go on sale, game. but it's not really important as to when I'm, I'm sure it'll be on sale in the next couple of weeks. All right. What's next? From DJ Infa Desert Eagle International. <laughs> Kevin Feige has successfully rebranded Snap as Blip and Spidey Sense as Tingle. Just because he could, or anything else. There are a few more, but they escape me at the moment. Guys in the chat, help. Well, remember, he didn't actually rebrand anything. They never referred to it as the Snap in the MCU. Yeah. We did. Because we saw a Snap. Did. Yeah. Uh, we called the Snap. They called it in the movies and shows the Blip. I don't know how successful he's been at branding it the blip because I still call it the snap. Yeah. And every, every commentator I hear talk about still refers to it as a snap. Blip seems so dismissive, too, for the people who left and then reemerged of, hey, those years you were gone, yeah. blip. It's just it's a blip. Just a blip. It was That's a rounding fine. error. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Your child was born and died. It, it was just a blip. blip. It was all the. What was the second one? Uh, tingle. 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 I, I've never heard it referred to as that. Uh, I mean, I haven't heard them refer to a spider sense yet. Which I, I'll be honest with you. I'm just being honest with you. Okay. Can can I can I just be honest with you for a second? Sure. 
I love the Spider-Man character. You guys, I've, I've defended the Spider-Man character. I hate the Iron Man juniorification of Spider-Man in the MCU. I like Spider-Man. I love Spider-Man. The most ridiculous thing about Spider-Man, though, is the Spider-Sense. Because everything about Spider-Man's powers are physical, right? A spider bit him, altered his DNA. He became faster, stronger, more agile, all that kind of stuff, right? In, in some iterations, he can spray web from himself. In other iterations, he creates mechanisms. To do that, that, that's all fine. That's all fine. Until we get the magical spider sense. It, it's literally magic. Spider sense is magic. It's something that there, even in, in a science fiction kind of way, you can't explain by, you know, oh, a, an altering of the structure in its cells to be stronger and faster and more agile. And I've always, I don't know, I've always kind of scratched my head a little bit at, the magical spider sense. It just seems a little bit weird to me. Hey, am I the only one? Am I the only one that's ever thought about that? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe no. We're all checked out. Well, I feel like, okay, you know that <laughs> feeling of impending doom that happens if you almost hit like another car or something or someone almost hits you? That little like thing in your brain that happens, that knee-jerk reaction of like, oh, thank God I'm like self-preserved. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's, that's the spider sense, just very, very heightened where it's just a few seconds ahead of that. But that's kind of a response to your other senses picking up little things. Yeah, well, he is spider he boy. I, uh, okay, I don't know. Listen, I'm not. I'm not trying to shit talk on Spider Sense. Okay, feels like you're trying I'm to shit talk the Peter Tingle. I've wondered about a little bit. That's all. He's just picking up on vibrations, baby. You know, <laughs> the vibes, like he do. The yeah. vibes. All right. What's next? From Sticks and Stones, sending in a twenty dollars super chat. Thank you, Thank you Sticks and Stones, there. for supporting us on that level. Saw Dune for the second time in 4DX here on the Golden Coast, Australia. Nice. The first time in the 4DX. My wife won't do it again, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm just glad that we'd seen it already, as it was a little distracting. That's okay. The problem with it. I have never been to a 4DX screening, but my wife and Ray and their sister, Olive, the three siblings, they decided to go to a 3DX screening, a 4DX screening of Maverick, right? It's Maverick that you guys yeah. went to go see. So, you got to pick and choose. You got to see choose. Maverick, right? And I know Olive hated it. Not the movie. But the 4D experience, and even my wife was like, that was kind of weird because it does the sensory thing. You know what? When you guys described your Maverick going experience uh -huh. with the way. Like, I, I liked it. I really liked it. I know you did. But when I heard the, the, the girls, when I heard your sisters talking about it, all I could think in my head was the shake weight in South Park. Of it releasing a refreshing yeah. cool down spray. That's the part that. Uh, <laughs> That's oh, you can turn that I, off. I, I had okay, to turn yeah. it off. Yeah. I mean, I, I gotta imagine eating like your snacks and stuff is kind of distracting. Nightmare. You're just like take, trying to take it's a, a drink. Or, you're about to eat popcorn, you get sprayed, and you're like, well, you these? Yes. That popcorn. Logan loves them because, of course, he does. <laughs> he loves them so much. We were seeing a movie. I'm gonna take him to see Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds if it ever. Oh no! <laughs> no, uh, you're gonna have to deal with him then. <laughs> Joke will be on you, buddy. <laughs> But we're, we're, I forget what movie we were seeing. I think it was Haunted Mansion, but it was a trailer for the Meg 2 first. Oh my God. And we're just holding our, our snacks and everything. And you're just the entire time, <laughs> just everything flailing everywhere. It's There's, not fun. Sonic was fun to watch. Sonic would be good. I Avatar, mean, I wanted maybe? to kill myself. <laughs> I wanted really? to throw myself in traffic instead of sit in that seat any longer. Because that's a long movie. It's got to be short, and it's got to be make sense, I think. It just it I mean, rattles your uh, brain. Top, Top Gun Maverick was long, but yet the, the flight parts, it only really did the motion during the flight parts, yeah. which was awesome, actually. I think something like Bridges of Madison County is more my speed <laughs> That's for 40X. Like just rolling it's just a nice little... <laughs> just a <laughs> yeah, when they That's go over great. the bridge. And well, don't do a water one. This is the one. sneaky thing that Regal yeah. does, though. Anytime there's a preview of a movie so I can go see it early, I have to see it in 4DX almost exclusively. Huh. You know what would be good? What? Godzilla X Kong. I would actually in 40X? I would actually check it out. I would actually check it out in 4DX. I, it might it might make me sick. That might be too much yeah, rocking. Too, yeah. The seats but, have a little flamethrower in it that blows <laughs> But I'm very face. interested yeah. in seeing that in 4DX. One go. of those movies. I've no, I, I have like obviously never been to a 4DX theater, but I'm going to have to try it at some point. Or uh, Ricky Stinnicky. Or <laughs> that's not going to be in theaters. That's oh, the Netflix only. The, imagine the motion in that one. <laughs> Ricky Stinnicky. <laughs> All right. Out. What's next? 
from Sin Vendetta. Hey, John, just curious, will you ever have another movie club? Maybe for Deadpool 3, like you did for Guardians 3 and Ant-Man Quantumania? I personally really enjoyed them. Like oh, you're talking about the ones? live and in-person yeah. events events we did. Not movie club, but right. the, the live and in-person events that we did. Um, well, we called that movie club. We ended Oh, up yeah, like, we yeah. did call that movie club, yep. didn't we? You know, somebody asked me that on an open mic the other day. I... I'm never going to say never. I doubt it right now because it was actually a real administrative nightmare. Like, look, we had a ball. Me, Greg, Christian, we had a ball doing that. But it was an administrative nightmare to pull it all together. Um, and I was the one who had to do it. And I, yeah, I just don't know. I mean, there's so much effort goes into making that thing, that those things happen and I don't know about it. Now, I have been asked by my uh, rep company if I would be willing to go on tour, and I and I basically told them, and by on tour, I don't mean like a 50 city. I mean like doing three or four places around the country to go and do like a live John Cavey show somewhere. Open for Taylor. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Me and the Swifties. But what I told them was, hey, listen, I'm open to it, but I don't want to do anything except get on a plane, land, go do it, and come home. I don't want to have anything else to do with it. Like, I, I have no, none of the arranging, none of the administrative stuff, none of the pulling things together. I, If you guys want to do that, I'll do it. I'll consider it. But so I don't know. We'll, we'll see, though. I'm never going to say never because for all I know, like, Harloff's going to give me a call in a couple of weeks say, I really want to do this. And then in I'll 40X. go, then they'll, 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 <laughs> Christian, here's, here's something Christian has a really interesting ability to do that not a lot of people have with me. Um, I'm not swayed by pitches very well. I'm and, and back when I was at AMC and stuff like that, running Collider, like a lot of people, I, I'm not swayed by pitches. Christian has a way to push my buttons though. Christian has a way of coming in to my office or giving me a call. And like, he he's a bit of a showman and a salesman. And I mean that in, the, in all the best ways possible. And he has a way of pitching me something that gets me kind of excited for it. So for all I know, maybe Christian gives me a call in a couple of weeks and it's like, I, John, we should do this. And here's and, and he'll get me excited about it. Whereas if Jonathan pitched it to me, maybe what I wouldn't get excited what? about Dang. it. No, no, that's no knock on you. I mean, anybody else <laughs> might pitch it to me and I wouldn't get excited about, it. but Christian has a way to push my buttons on that level. He's a salesman. Well. He's a salesman. He's really good at it. That He worked for WWE yeah. before. So, I mean, it's kind of in his DNA. All right. What's next? Uh, here we go. Members. He's not switching. <laughs> From yeah. I'm like, you figure out what's yeah, next. Yeah. Jonathan, where are you going? <laughs> it's going to be one shot from now on. What's next is me the screen. Right now. CJ Rebirth. 14 years since Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland movie came out in theaters. I've been a fan of it since day one, and lots of other people loved it since it's in the Billion Dollar Club. Yeah, I was never... I didn't mind that film, to be honest. I'm not a big Tim Burton fan. Uh, there's certainly some of his films that I really quite like. I wasn't big on that movie, although I think I liked it. I really didn't like the sequel. The sequel was terrible. Yeah. Um, did he even direct the sequel? Uh, I think so, man. He might have. But I, I really didn't like the sequel at all. But, man, it's it's weird that that much time has gone by. All right. What's next? From Mr. Javalanti. Hi, John. You've mentioned in the past that the pace of a movie determines the length. What movies come to mind for you that have near perfect pacing? Ooh, I mean, Dune 2 uh, for me um, is really fabulous. I, you know, I think pacing is such an important thing that almost any movie that I would consider great has to have great pacing. It's, it's like one of those things, if pacing is off in a movie, that is something that, like, even more than a bad performance or bad action or whatever, I don't know that there's anything, any one element that can lower a movie in my perception as much as bad pacing, whether it's too ahead of itself or too slow. Like, so almost any movie that I would say I truly, truly love, I would automatically have to think had really good pacing because pacing, bad pacing kills a movie for me really does all right what's next from mr hank dunn can i call myself a good canadian kid i'm not canadian but i'm from buffalo which is basically <laughs> a canadian city tim horton's at every corner everyone loves hockey and most of us say sorry boot dat uh, i will say this to my and by the way i love buffalo i uh, despite the fact that i heard one comedian refer to buffalo as the 
as a geological miracle, it's the only above ground hole. Uh, and, and I think that was a Buffalo, <laughs> it was a Buffalo comedian that said that, oh, so, that's good. but it was, it was just pretty funny, but I love Buffalo because you're not wrong. It was literally right, right across the border from me where I grew up in Hamilton. It was like, and me, we, me and some friends would go to some Buffalo Sabres games instead of Toronto Maple Leaf games. Not because we, I mean, I'm a huge Toronto fan, but we couldn't dream of affording to be able to go to Toronto Maple Leaf games, but we could afford to go to Buffalo Sabres games. I love Buffalo. Big fan there. So. I will say you're like an adopted Canadian. An honorary. An honorary Aww. adopted Canadian. Maybe not by blood. Maybe not. Like, maybe you're like Paul Atreides, who you've been kind of brought into the Fremen. You're not of Arrakis, but we'll say you're adopted in. All right. What's next? Oh, real quick. Uh, Through the Looking Glass, that other sequel to uh, Alice in Wonderland was directed by James Bobbin. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. I had so it a little itch in my head that maybe yeah. it wasn't him that did that. All right. What's next? From DC 63 Productions 88, saw Doom Part 2 last Friday and I absolutely adored it. What do you think its chances of joining the Billion Dollar Club are? And do you think it'll be a heavy hitter at the Oscars next year? It's going to win everything at the Oscars, yeah, the Oscars and, it's, yes. and it's not going to join the Billion Dollar Club. Ooh. It's, it's just not a, I, I've said this the whole time, it's just not a movie for the masses. Uh, now, you could also say that Oppenheimer wasn't really a movie for the masses, and it got pretty close to the Billion Dollar Club. Um, absolutely. But I, I just don't think it is a movie enough for the masses. I just think it's so much of a movie that's not going to be for everybody that it's going to be very successful. But I, like I said originally a, few, a couple weeks ago, I said I think it's going to finish between five and seven hundred million. It's It's crazy because Oppenheimer... I remember after seeing that, I thought it, it was the best movie of the year. It's the best movie of the year. But I also said that I'm only going to watch this one time, at least in theaters. But it was a long film. Same thing with Dune 2. But yet, look how much Oppenheimer made. So yeah, you never Oppenheimer know. came real close to the Billion Dollar Club. And, and, and it was, it was uh, with Barbie, too, like in the theaters with Barbie. Yep, Dune is by time. itself right now in these the next two weeks. I'm, I'm still holding on it to 818. It might get close. I, I just I don't even think it gets I'm, close. I'm hoping it gets close. It deserves I mean, I to get so. close. I I I'm I hope I'm wrong about this, but it deserves to get all the money. I think it makes somewhere close to six. Six a little over, a little under. Which that tracks mm, higher than the that's original. Low, but man. I'm going eight eighteen. I'm going eight. I'm going eight. I hope you're right. At least eight. I hope you're right. hundred percent I hope you're right. Okay, what's next? From Akshay Thakur, 5603. Sorry, I probably butchered that. With the Fantastic Four now joining the MCU, do you think we'll see a fight between the Hulk and the Thing in a future MCU film? I mean, we'd love to see it. I, I, I'll i be honest with you. I'm more interested in seeing um, Hulk versus Wolverine. Uh, that's the one I'm kind of more interested yeah, in seeing. Yeah, oh yeah. But uh, Hulk versus Thing would be great. That's one of the first comics I ever owned was Hulk and Thing fighting each other on the cover. Uh, it'd be really cool. However, they've kind of put that to rest in the comics a lot in the last number of years that, you know what, actually the thing, the thing doesn't come anywhere close to Hulk. Uh, they even just, I remember I was watching comics explained and they were, they were, he was going over this one story where there's even a scene where Bruce walks into a bar where Ben is sitting and they don't really like each other. They, they don't straight up hate each other, but they don't like each other. And like one of the departing shots was when Bruce is walking out, he basically says to him, like, you do know that every time we fought, I was like 90% pulling my punches, right? And then there's like this sub thing in it where Ben, that really got to Ben because he knew it was true. So they've, they've kind of undermined the big, like Thrilla in Manila kind of, you know, Ali versus Frazier kind of feel of it when they the comics themselves has kind of laid it out that actually Hulk versus Thing ends early in the first round. So I, so I would still like to see it, but I think they've taken some of the smoke out of it a little bit. To be honest yeah, with you, they wouldn't put the, they they wouldn't do that to one of their heroes at least. Sure, they show heroes fighting each other all the time. Yeah, but then like okay, the Hulk and Thor thing, right? Well, everyone knows Hulk probably beat Thor, right? Did it Hulk depends be, on who you ask. Yeah, see, that's 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 it's probably, a it's a much closer thing. Yeah, that, that's probably the way they're gonna end that if they ever did it. Same thing with Wolverine. It's there's not gonna be a clear winner. They're yeah, not well, gonna... like, see, even in the comic, like in World War Hulk, Wolverine took care of, I mean, Hulk took care of Wolverine pretty quick, too. Oh, did so, he? Yeah. I don't, oh, wow. Well, World War, in World War Hulk, he takes out everybody. Yeah, I yeah. mean, he, he, like, all the world's heroes get, I didn't even like, remember they fought in World War Hulk. He wouldn't I... even have to really, like, try to kill or whatever. He literally could just take Wolverine and throw him two states away. Yeah. That, and, <laughs> and then it's like, well, you're going to be hours speedball. to ever finding me again. Yeah, so. a very long distance speedball. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right, what's next? 
Fastball, I should oh. say. From Patrick Reese, have you heard of anything to do with the Dune TV show about the witches? I feel like after this movie, announcing it would really gain some traction. Uh, David Zaslav just recently said in an investor call, he talked about three shows they have coming this year. Uh, what's it called? Uh, not Hatchet. Hatches? Hatchet. It's a popular show that people like. Hackers. Hacker. No. Is it Hack? No, not Hackers. Hacks on HBO? Is what? that what you're trying to talk about? Which one? Hacks. Hacks. Thank okay. you. Okay. The Gene Smart Show? Um, they said that's coming. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we've got uh, House of the Dragon mm -hmm. and the Benny Jesuit. Uh, okay. coming so i assume he meant by that that it's going to come this year are, are but i haven't heard anything else than that cool? are we talking about the witches that were with uh uh austin butler's character is that the witches we're talking about his like little minions well there's no 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 no, no. we're talking about the actual like the lady like uh his paul's mom oh is yeah one of them. yeah well nonetheless either or they both look creepy to me in the film <laughs> well no you're, you know because you know the old lady who first put tells paul to put his hand in the right, box right, right? yeah that, that order that's Ugh. they're making a show about yeah, that order that scary. takes place like 500 years before the events of dune or something like that mm -hmm. so but so as far as i know later this year but they have no more details other than that okay what's next uh from zach gazi hey john love you on the show Thank One of my you. favorite movies is Cloverfield. Uh, it's absolutely amazing till this date, and I've been waiting for the trailer or any news about the new upcoming Clover movie. Do you think we will hear anything about it this year? I almost forgot that they said they were going to be doing something else mm -hmm. that takes were place they? in that universe. Yeah. Uh, to, to be honest with you, it's only fragments in my head about what they've said they were or weren't doing. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not a big fan of the Cloverfield stuff, even the first one. Not the first one. The, I think a lot of people do. A lot of people do, but I, I just, I don't know. The first one was okay to me. The last one was garbage. Paradox? What's that? Was it Paradox on Netflix? Yes. Remember, it was supposed to go theatrical, and then, like, uh, I, on, it was either the Super Bowl, I think it was the Super Bowl, where they said, hey, guys, this is going to be on Netflix tomorrow. And, like, they at the last second, they moved from theatrical to Netflix, and then we watched it, and we're like, oh, that's why they moved it to Netflix. It was just awful. The one with Mary Elizabeth Weinstead and John Goodman. I like that one. Cloverfield yeah, that Lane. One. Yes. That one was pretty good. Really that one was pretty good. Yeah. Um, I just, but not a huge fan of the uh, overall uh, thing, then. That's as far as I'm reading right now, there's no movement on it at all. There's the, not even a date. There's not even a projected when they're going to start production. It, it, it's listed, but it's there's nothing. The hmm. last thing that really came up for this is if you guys remember the Slusho website and Slusho Beverages. That's right. I do remember that. That website became active again last year. But oh. other than that. But when's hmm. the last time it was active? Can you buy stuff from it? Like a drink? Is it a drink? Like a yeah. What's Slush Show? So you can't actually the, buy it though. The oh. beverage. All right. They have all this stuff. What's with. next? Uh, from Dominic Suma, love you. Uh, oh, John, <laughs> you love Star Wars. I was like, love you, Star Wars. John, you love Star Wars more than anything. But when you hear Harrison Ford, do you think of Han Solo or Indiana Jones first? Han Solo. But uh, no, no question. Like that's automatic. Han I Solo. think of him telling that magician to get out of his house. Yeah. Get the, uh, the, the David the Blaine yeah. video is one of the, it's the reason YouTube exists. Uh, if you have not seen, just search David Blaine, Harrison Ford. It is one of the best things I have ever seen on the YouTube. It's fantastic. <laughs> Get the fuck out of my house. It's one of the best things ever. You got to go see it. All right. What's next? From Red One Real Talk. Did any of you see that Adam Sandler's Spaceman movie quietly dropped on Netflix over the weekend? Do you have any plans to see it? Yes. I didn't catch, I mean, I, I heard this morning that it had actually dropped. I, I didn't know when it was coming out and suddenly it's out. Apparently there are a bunch of people kind of mad at it because they thought it was going to be this sci-fi. Oh yeah, that's space. what it sounds like. And, and like a bunch of people, and I haven't seen it myself, so I, I'm not saying anything. I haven't seen it. But like apparently I was reading the story where a bunch of people upset, like, I guess they should have put a thing of, uh, uh, who wrote it? One of the outlets wrote, I guess they should have put a disclaimer on it saying, this is just about a lonely man in space. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, again, I haven't seen it yet, so I can't say anything. But, um, but I he's am, in space, though, right? That's, What's that? He's that's, in space, though. He's in space. Okay, that's what well, the trailer looks like. He even, the spider, yeah. voiced by Paul Dano, know. is even like, yep. I want to help you with your loneliness, lonely space traveler. 
Yeah, so but maybe they thought that in the midst of that they were gonna fight aliens or I don't know. But oh, it's like it's a, no. it's a that, movie about sound. a lonely guy in space. So yeah. okay. I am gonna check it out. I did I did until this morning I didn't even know it'd come out oh, yet, man. but I will check it out. Yeah, I watched that trailer last night and was like, what the fuck is this? This looks amazing. <laughs> All right, what's next? From Colby. Hi, John. Do you think James Gunn will continue to share updates and pictures from the filming of Superman? Yes, 100%. Um, he's, he almost, I love James, but, you know, he, and I love that he is active on social media and he will shut down rumors and things like that. But I almost feel like he's too engaged online. He should reel it back a bit. But I, who am I to say? I, I love James. and But yes, I 100% think he will share updates and pictures as they go. I mean, he started off with just the table read. Remember, he put out that big picture. Was like, You're coming out of the table read. So yeah, he'll, he'll share a lot of stuff, I think. All right. Two more questions and we're going to call it a day. What's next? From Mr. Javaletti. Hi, John. You've mentioned in the past that the... Oh, no, we've done this one. Oh, then the whole we have was Okay, so this, then... So let me move it up. My Kid Banana. Hot take. I really didn't like the Dune book. I thought it was lacking in character development, but I did love the world building and mythology. For me, the movies are way better than the book. One of the rare cases of adaptation being better than the source material. I've heard a few people say that. I, I, I mean, those might be fighting words if Robert Meyer Burnett were here. Uh, but I, I mean, look, I read the books for the first time and I, not all the books, just, just up to Dune Messiah, uh, sometime in my AMC days. And I'm not going to pretend they're my favorite, like up there with my favorite sci-fi books of all time. I, they're, they're not as much as a, like, they're a little bit more of a, um, you know how in the Lord of the Rings books, you can get on seven pages describing the grass on the, the hills they're walking yes, over. Yes, I do. I find that you can get lost in the language of the Dune book a little bit, although certainly not inaccessible. Um, I personally like the movies more than the books, and I like the ch I really like the changes the movies have made to the books. So, but I've heard from some people that feel that way. Other people still feel that the books are better, but they love the movie anyway. So, yeah, I, I totally see where you're coming from because I personally agree. All right, guys. And that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campion Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in questions, number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about, but number two, you supported this channel as you did it and all of us involved with the show. Thank you guys so very much for your support. I want to thank the people in the room with me, Ray Ora. See you next time. Chris Carr. Bye. And I don't listen to Jonathan Voico. <gasps> So, Cut that camera. And of course, <laughs> producer Jonathan Voico, who won't even bring up the image now. There we go. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye. <laughs> Shut it down.